Welcome to this week's first lecture in EE404. In the last lectures, we have seen linear systems and their phase plane trajectories. And then we have classified the equilibrium points of linear systems. And we have seen that this classification can be made based on the eigenvalues of the A matrix of the linear system. In today's first lecture, in this lecture, we're going to actually start by summarizing what we have done so far. We were given a linear system, x dot is equal to ax, and a here is in R2 by 2, and that means x is in R2. And we would like to classify the equilibrium points of the system, meaning the, meaning the origin of, of, of x, such that the, the, the equilibrium points are classified with respect to the motion of the system or the trajectories of the system around those equilibrium points. So here, the first thing that we do is to calculate the eigenvalues. D of S is determinant as I minus A. And I have here, this is the characteristic polynomial. And this is given as S minus lambda 1 and S minus lambda 2. And depending on these eigenvalues, we, we have seen that we can classify the equilibrium points. So here there is an implicit assumption that we have a single equilibrium point. Remember, if there is an equilibrium zone of, or if the whole state space is, in, is equilibrium, then we don't name those equilibrium points with any specific name. We don't classify such equilibrium points. But here, I am assuming that determinant A is not equal to zero, and we are then trying to classify the equilibrium point, which is the origin of this second order linear system. And what were the results that we have, we have found? So the first case was the case when lambda 1 and lambda 2 are real. In this case, we can talk about the sign of the eigenvalues, because both of them are, are real. If they have the same sign, which means lambda 1 times lambda 2, if, if this is positive, then that means that we have a node type of equilibrium point. Okay? No oscillations, and there is, there is either divergence or convergence towards the equilibrium point. And if the sign of the eigenvalues are both positive, then we have, we have an unstable node. If we have the reverse property, sign of the eigenvalues are strictly negative, we have stable node. In this case, you see that we are not considering the case when at least one of the eigenvalues uh, is equal to zero, because that would make the A matrix non-invertible, meaning that we will have an equilibrium zone that we don't classify. So this was the case for, for this property. And remember that if we have the reverse inequality like this, if the signs of the eigenvalues are not the same, if the signs are opposite, then we call such an equilibrium point as stable, sorry, as saddle point. And we know that a saddle point is inherently an unstable type of equilibrium point because there are some trajectories around the saddle point equilibrium point which would diverge away from the equilibrium point. We call an equilibrium point a stable equilibrium point if all of the trajectories in a neighborhood around that equilibrium point would converge to the equilibrium point. And we call an equilibrium point a divergent equilibrium point if there exists a single trajectory, or, or more than one trajectory, which would diverge from the equilibrium point when we started in a neighborhood around the equilibrium point. So we have a saddle point definition. So this was the first case that we have examined. And the second case was when the case when lambda 1 and lambda 2 are complex. And in this case, I can talk about 
the eigenvalues in this form, alpha plus j beta, and lambda 2 is equal to alpha minus j beta. Okay? And we have seen that the, so here for these eigenvalues to be complex, of course, beta should not be equal to zero. Otherwise, we, we come back to the node type of equilibrium point when both of the eigenvalues have the same sign. Remember, in this case, the classification happens depending on the sign of alpha. If alpha is positive, then the equilibrium point is at the origin is called a st unstable focus. If alpha is negative, then we have a stable focus. And if alpha is equal to zero, then we have a center. Remember, in that case, the the trajectories are not diverging, are not converging, but they are, they are periodic trajectories, all right? So, so now, we are going to actually draw a pictorial representation of these equilibrium point types depending on some, some summary statistics that we can call the determinant of A and the so-called trace of A, okay? Here is what I'm going to do. Suppose that this A is given like this. A11, A12, A21, and A22. Then I can calculate the matrix SI minus A as follows. S minus A11, S minus A22, A12, and minus A12, and minus A21. All right? And the determinant of this thing is going to give me the characteristic polynomial. D of S is S squared minus A11 plus A22S plus A11, A22 minus A12, A21. So you see that this polynomial it actually has some coefficients which we can name based on the properties of this A matrix. So maybe naming this one is the, is the easiest. The other one, you may not have seen it before. That is why I'm going to name it later. So you see that this is nothing but the determinant of this matrix, right? A two by two matrix. So I have, I'm going to define D as the determinant of A, which is A11, A22, minus A12, A21, okay? And what about this, this term? So this term is a summation of the diagonal elements of the matrix A. Okay? In linear algebra, summation of the diagonal elements of a square matrix has a specific name. And it is nothing but the trace of the matrix A. I will call the trace with the letter capital T. And this, this is a definition, and it is trace of A. It is a summation of the diagonal elements of a square matrix. And in the two by two case, we have just this summation, okay? So you see that I can write D of S based on only these two scalars, which are the statistics that we can get from the matrix A. If I do this, then D of S is going to be S squared minus, I would have here the trace times S plus the determinant, okay? I know that this D of S should be factorized into this form, into, into factors related to the eigenvalues. So I'm going to write this as S minus lambda 1, S minus lambda 2, and this happens to be S squared minus lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 1 times lambda 2. And we see that here, this polynomial should be equal to this polynomial. There is some mistake here. There is an S missing. And for this polynomial to be equal to this polynomial for all S values, 
I need to have the coefficients of these two polynomials equal, okay? But that means that this t is nothing but the summation of the eigenvalues, lambda 1 plus lambda 2, and the determinant d has to be the multiplication of the eigenvalues. These are rather interesting properties, and here you have to believe me that these properties, they, they would hold for any size A matrix. So this was just a derivation for the 2 by 2 case, but you can make sure that, actually you can prove that such properties are correct, or they, are, they hold, even when A is an N by N matrix. So in general, the trace of a matrix is the summation of the eigenvalues of that matrix, and the determinant of a matrix is the multiplication of the eigenvalues of that matrix. Remember that if the determinant is zero, the matrix is not invertible. But if the determinant is zero, because determinant should be the multiplication of the eigenvalues of that matrix, when determinant is zero, there should be at least one eigenvalue of the matrix which is exactly equal to zero. Similarly, if, if one of the eigenvalues is zero, then we know that determinant should be equal to zero with these properties. Okay? So now this type of reasoning allow me to write these eigenvalues based on the trace and the determinant of the matrix. If I calculate the discriminant of this polynomial, then it's going to be t squared minus 4d. And if I calculate the roots of this polynomial based on this, this discriminant, then it's going to be lambda 1, 2 is equal to minus b. I have t plus minus square root of discriminant. I have t squared minus 4d divided by 2. Okay? So you see that the eigenvalues can be characterized by looking at only the trace and the determinant of the matrix. Now let me try to, so I will just erase this part. So let me try to characterize the equilibrium points based on these quantities, these statistics T and D. I will have this axis here, and I will sh the x-axis is going to represent the trace of the matrix, and the y-axis is going to represent the determinant of the matrix. Now, for every trace and determinant pair, I need to be able to classify the corresponding equilibrium point, because every trace and determinant would specify the eigenvalues that I would get from that matrix, okay? So maybe in order to be able to do that classification, I need to know how, how, what this t squared minus 4d is. We see that if I equate t squared minus 4d to 0, then this would mean that d is equal to t squared over 4. Okay? But you see that this is nothing but a parabola in dt plane or td plane. So this parabola is going to pass through the origin and it's going to be convex upwards like this. So this is the parabola d is equal to t squared over 4 and I have d is equal to t squared over 4. Okay? So we know that t squared minus 4d is exactly equal to 0 on that parabola and it is going to change sign if we are above or below that parabola. Okay? Now let us try to characterize what being above this parabola would mean. If you are above the, par if above the parabola, then that means that d is strictly larger than t squared over 4. Okay? 
if we are above the parabola, then d should be larger than t squared over 4. But this means that t squared minus 4d, take this 4 to here, and then take 4d to the, to the left, right, then you see that t squared minus 4d is smaller than 0. So this means that if we are above that parabola, then t squared minus 4d is going to be negative. This discriminant delta is going to be negative. Okay? And if we are below that parabola, then the discriminant is going to be positive. So we see that both of the eigenvalues will be complex if this discriminant is negative. Okay? So that means that above this parabola is going to be my complex eigenvalue case and below this parabola is going to be my real eigenvalue case. Okay? So let us first concentrate on the, on the complex eigenvalue case. So suppose that we are above this parabola. In that case, this thing is negative, and we know that I would have square root of negative quantity is going to give me the imaginary part of, of my eigenvalues. Imaginary part does not determine the type of the type of the equilibrium point, but it determines the frequency of oscillations. The real part is going to be t in that case. Okay? So if t is positive, then I have unstable focus type of equilibrium point. So I'm above the parabola and t is positive, then we have unstable focus. So here, this region here, is the unstable focus region. On the other hand, if the real part is negative, then we have stable focus type of equilibrium point. So I have here stable focus type of equilibrium point. And what about centers? Where are centers? For centers, I need the real part to be equal to zero, and that corresponds to t being equal to zero, meaning that this, on this line, on this positive y-axis, my classification is going to be center type of equilibrium points. Okay? Now this completes the complex eigenvalue case. Now let us try to concentrate the real eigenvalue case. In the real eigenvalue case, we are going to be, be below this parabola. All right? And depending on the sign of the multiplication of the eigenvalues, we are going to be either having a node type of equilibrium point or we are going to be having a saddle point type of equilibrium point. But the multiplication of eigenvalues is determined by D here. Okay? So if we are, if we are below this, this parabola and if D is positive, so if we are below the parabola and if d is positive, that means that we are either here or here in this, in this region. Okay? So these regions are going to be node type of equilibrium points because the sign of the eigenvalues would be, would be the same. On the other hand, if we are below that parabola and if d is negative, d is negative, then we are going to have a saddle point type of equilibrium point. So if d is negative, it's below the x-axis, then I would have saddle points. Okay? So the only remaining part here is to determine whether this is a stable node or unstable node, or this is a stable node or, or an unstable node. So here, if both of the eigenvalues are positive, then the determinant is going to be positive and trace is going to be positive. Okay? Summation of two positive numbers is positive. That means that here, in this part, I would have just 
unstable north type of equilibrium point and if both of the eigen if multiplication is positive and if the traces sorry if the multiplication is negative and if the, uh, if the, both of the eigen values maybe now i'm going to say the correct thing if the multiplication is positive and if the sum is negative if the trace is negative then that means that we have stable node okay that is t being negative t being positive so both of these parts are node type of equilibrium points and depending on whether t is negative or t is positive they become unstable or stable nodes all right so you see that when you look at the trace trace determinant plane like this you can see which type of equilibrium points that we are going to have depending on the values of d and t So this completes the analysis of linear systems, phase plane trajectory of linear systems. Now what I'm going to do is to solve a couple of examples. Actually it's going to be the same example but I will, after solving the example I'm going to modify it just a little bit and we'll get a new example from that. So let me write the example. I have x dot is equal to minus 3, 3. I have 6 and 0 here, x. And what I need to do is to draw the face portrait in x1, x2 play. Okay. So the state space of the system is x1, x2 plane, and we're going to draw the phase plane trajectories of our phase portrait in the x1, x2 plane. So remember, in order to be able to deal with both the, both the real and the complex eigenvalue cases, we made some state transformations. So here, we, we can of course do the same thing here, but whatever we do, whatever coordinate system we go into, the results should be plotted in the x1, x2 plane. Okay, that is the meaning of asking th this question in this, in this way. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix. Let us do, this is my A matrix, SI minus A, sorry. SI minus A is going to be S plus three, minus three, minus six, and S. That gives me the characteristic polynomial S square plus three S, and I have, I have minus, minus 80, okay? So I can separate this as 6 and, and minus 3. So that gives me s plus 6 and s minus 3. So we see that I have two eigenvalues and with different signs. Lambda 1 is minus 6 and lambda 2 is equal to 3. 
So I, have a, I am going to have a saddle point type of equilibrium point. Am I sure that there is only a single equilibrium point at the origin for this linear system? I am actually sure by looking at the determinant. Determinant is minus 18, and that means that it is non-zero, meaning that none of the eigenvalues can be equal to zero. But you see already that the both of the eigenvalues are non-zero here, so that A matrix is invertible, meaning that this system has a single isolated equilibrium point at the origin. Okay? And we are trying to classify that equilibrium point, and after the classification, we can draw the face portrait in x1, x2 plane. So let me find the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of this matrix corresponding to these eigenvalues. So I have A minus lambda 1 identity. It is going to be A plus 6 identity. And that is going to be, I will add 6 into the diagonals of this matrix. 3, 3. And I have 6, 6 here. Okay? And the first eigenvector belonging to lambda 1 is going to be in the null space of this matrix. So I need to find a single non-zero vector which would give me zero vector when I multiply it with this matrix. But you see that it is really easy to find such a vector and it's going to be 1 and minus 1 or any multiple of this vector. Now let us calculate the second eigenvector belonging to lambda 2 equals to 3. And I have A minus 3 identity, lambda 2 identity. And this means that I'm going to subtract 3 from the diagonals of this matrix. I have minus 6, 3, and I have minus 3, and I have 6 here. And I'm going to find a non-zero vector, which is going to give me zero vector when I multiply it with this matrix. That is going to be my second eigenvector. E2 is going to be, you see that if I multiply this matrix with the vector 1 and 2, composed of 1 and 2, that is going to give me zero. So that is my second eigenvector. So well, this is lambda 1 equals to minus 6, and this is lambda 2 equals to 3. Now I can try to draw the trajectories of this system onto x1, x2 plane. Not z1, z2 plane. We know that z1, z1 axis is going to be this one, the line corresponding to this vector, and z2 axis is going to be the line corresponding to this vector. But here, what we would like to do is to draw the trajectories onto, onto x1, x2 axis. All right? So let me, let me draw here z1 axis. It is, it is composed of the vector, it includes the vector 1 and minus 1. So it's going to be this line here. This is a line corresponding to the first eigenvector, meaning that this is z1 axis. Okay? And what is the where is the positive z1 axis? So 1 minus 1, so the positive z1 axis is going to be this one. All right? This part is the negative z1 axis. And here, the second eigenvector is going to give me the z2 axis. And uh, z2 axis is going to be composed of the vector 1 and 2. And this is 1, and 2 is going to be somewhere here. And it's going to pass through this point. And that is my z2 axis. So if I draw the trajectory of the system on z1, z2 axis, it's going to look like this. z1, z2. On this axis, the eigenvalue is negative. That means that we are going to be converging to this equilibrium point on the first axis. And on the second axis, we are going to have the eigenvalue positive, meaning that the trajectories will diverge away from the equilibrium point. Other than these, I would have this type of saddle point type of trajectories. And I can easily put the directions here like this by making them in harmony with the, with the axis directions, all right? But here I, I need the trajectories in x1, x2 plane. 
So here, you know, on Z1 axis, I know that if I start the system anywhere on this line, the trajectories would be going towards the equilibrium point. They will not be able to leave this line, but they will be converging to the equilibrium point, which is at the origin. And on the, on the second line, E2, corresponding to E2, the trajectories will not be leaving them either, but they would be getting away from the equilibrium point. Okay? And then what I have to do is to fill in the rest, just like I do in the Z1, Z2 plane. So the trajectories are going to be parallel to to the two axes, as you see here, and they're going to go like this. And the direction of motion will be just going to be in harmony with the directions on these axes. And I would have trajectories here like this. And here, I would have trajectories like this. And here, I would have trajectories like this. So now this looks like a face portrait. I can actually draw multiple trajectories here, uh, which correspond to different initial, initial conditions. And the face portrait of the system would be looking like this. So now this completes this example. So I have drawn the face plane trajectories onto x1, x2 plane for a saddle point type of equilibrium point. And now I'm going to repeat this example for, for a focus type of equilibrium point for some complex eigenvalues. So let's say example, I'm just going to make a, make a very small change here. So I will just change this plus 3 to minus 3. And x dot is equal to, so I have minus 3, and I have minus 3 here, and I have 6 and 0. The matrix Si minus A is going to be S plus 3, S, and I have 3 and minus 6 here. And that is going to give me the characteristic polynomial D of S, S squared plus 3S plus 18. Now I can find the eigenvalues corresponding to this. The discriminant is 9 minus 4 times this. I have 72. And, and I would have here, in this case, 6 to 3. And then the, eigenval the eigenvalues are going to be lambda 1, 2 is equal to minus 3 plus minus square root 6 to 3 divided by 2. Actually, there is a minus sign here. I shouldn't forget it. So this is going to be j square root 6 to 3. So you see that our eigenvalues are both complex as we expected, and I have here the real part of the eigenvalues, which is the, the so-called alpha. This is alpha plus j beta. This beta determines the frequency of oscillations, and alpha determines if the oscillations are stable or unstable, if they are going towards the equilibrium point or getting away from the equilibrium point. We see that I have alpha is strictly smaller than zero, meaning that we are going to have a stable focus type of equilibrium point. And now we have, to, we have to draw the trajectories onto x1, x2 plane. So I need to draw trajectories here on x1, x2. But the question is, OK, we know that alpha is, is negative, meaning that the trajectories will converge to the equilibrium point. So it is really not important here if I draw ellipsoids or if I draw circular type of, type of trajectories. So really, I don't really care about if I draw ellipsoids here like this or ellipsoids here like this. But what is important for me is that I need to take the direction of the 
resulting oscillations uh, correct, okay? So I want to, in my drawing, I want to make the direction of the oscillations correct. So are the stable focus oscillations, are they like this? So is it going to be like this? Or I have this direction, so I have counterclockwise direction. And I have here x1, x2. I am again going to draw a similar figure, but in that case I have, I have a clockwise direction. Which one is it going to be? We know that in our theoretical analysis, the direction, the direction of the oscillations were determined by this beta. If beta was, was positive and negative, the direction was changing, changing sign. But here, the, the interesting thing is that if I use the first eigenvalue, beta is going to be negative or positive. If I use the other eigenvalue, it's going to be the negative, the uh, other one. The, the other one which is going to be negative. All right? So depending on which eigenvalue I choose, the sign of beta is changing. All right? Is this a contradiction? So shouldn't this curve have a specific oscillation direction? If I use the, one of the eigenvalues in my analysis, beta would be positive. If I use the other eigenvalue, beta is going to be negative. Isn't this a contradiction? The direction cannot be positive uh, and negative uh, clockwise or, uh, and counterclockwise at the same time. The answer to this question is that it is not contradictory. Remember, when we take lambda 1 as alpha plus j beta, then our new coordinate axis were determined as real of E1 and the imaginary E1. Okay? If I take, if I make my analysis based on the other eigenvalue lambda 2, alpha minus j beta, my new coordinate axis would be determined by the real and imaginary part of the other eigenvalue. Okay, other eigenvector. So I have imaginary E2. But we know that E2 is nothing but E1 conjugate. Okay? So you see that the real parts of these eigenvectors should be the same, but the imaginary parts of these eigenvectors should be, should be having the opposite signs. Okay? So if I use, so if I, then I can write real of E2 is equal to real of E1, and imaginary of E2 would be negative of imaginary E1, okay? So remember, this first vector represents Z1 axis, and the second vector represents Z2 axis. So you see that if when I, when I use the first eigenvalue in my analysis, the Z1 axis is represented by this vector, and Z2 axis is represented by that vector. And beta has a specific sign. What happens if I use the other eigenvector in my analysis? In that case, the Z1 axis becomes the Z2, Z1 axis in the previous case, but Z2 axis changes its sign. Meaning that Z2 axis is going to be in the reverse direction of the Z2 axis in the first case. Okay? And on that axis, the, in these new axis, this beta is going to change sign. Okay? So the, so the question is, if I have Z1 and Z2 axis, and if I had some, some rot direction of rotation there, when I change my axis to Z1 and minus Z2 here, in that case, the rotation direction with respect to the Z1 and Z2 axis is going to be opposite. 
But really this doesn't mean that on the x1 and x2 axis we are going to have different rotation directions for the same system. Okay? The, this, this change of the direction rotation happens because of the inversion of the reversal of one of the axes here. Z2 axis. Okay? So then, how should we determine the direction of rotation for this system, for this specific system? If I try to use the real imaginary parts, you see that there are really lots of complicated things. Determining the sign of beta, drawing Z1 and Z2 here. I really do not want to deal with Z1 and Z2 axis here on this on this. Uh, for this system and I really do not want to deal with what the sign of beta would be on the on those new axes okay instead we are going to use a very very uh, simple simple method here okay to determine the direction of rotation for for this system without dealing with new coordinate axis, without dealing with the sine of beta, etc. Okay? So suppose that I have this x1 and x2 axis. This is my equilibrium point. I want to understand if the rotation is like this or it is, it's like this. Counterclockwise or clockwise. Okay? I know that the rotations are either like this or they are they're like this. All I want to do is to determine the direction of rotation. So what I'm doing is just choose just a single point on one of the axes. Okay? I know that the state is rotating. That, that means that the trajectories of the system are either going to cross this cross this, this, this axis like this, or they're going to cross it like that, okay? And determining which one it is, is going to determine the direction of the rotation. If we are crossing this axis like this, then that means that we are having a clockwise rotation. If we are crossing this axis like this, then that means that we are having a counterclockwise rotation, okay? So choose any point on the, any non-zero point on this axis. Let us say that x is equal to one zero, okay? What is x dot? What is the velocity or the system at that state? I know that x dot is going to be a times x, and our a is given to us, by the way, there is an x missing here, sorry for that, a times x, but if I multiply the vector 1, 0 with that matrix, that is going to give me the first column of that matrix. So this is going to be just minus 3, 6. Multiply this vector with that matrix, it's going to just give me the first column. So the velocity at this point should be just minus 3 and 6. What does it mean? The velocity is going to have minus 3 component in the x1 direction and it's going to have component 6 in the x2 direction. That means that my, velo my velocity vector is going to be looking like this. Okay? This is my overall velocity vector. But this shows us that we are going to cross this axis in that direction. Okay? That is telling us, telling us that we are going to be, we are going to have have a counterclockwise rotation here. Okay. So if I want to choose one of these these two, this is going to be wrong, and that is going to be the correct one. I can do the same thing by by taking another point as well. But usually it is easiest to, to select a point on one of the axes. You can choose other axes here, this one for example. So this point is x is equal to 0, 1. Okay? If x is equal to 0, 1, what is x dot there? 
x star is the multiplication of this vector with that A matrix. But when I multiply this vector with that matrix, it's going to give me the second column, minus 3 and 0. But that means that the velocity here at this point is going to have minus 3 component on the, in the x1 axis and it has 0 component in the x2 axis. So this is going to be my velocity at that point. Okay? So you see, you see that we are again pointing in the, in the counterclockwise direction. All right? So here I can actually, based on this very, very simple analysis, compared to finding the eigenvectors, finding the real parts, imaginary parts, drawing them onto this figure, and then finding the sign of beta, etc. Instead of that, just choose some points on the axis and see that the rotations are going to be, this one would be going like this, and we would crossing this horizontally, and we would have a rotation converging to the to the equilibrium point like this. Okay. So although we made our analysis in a much more complicated way, drawing the approximate trajectories for for systems with complex linear systems with complex eigenvalues is much easier, and it is just determining if the, if the real part is negative or positive or just exactly equal to zero and then taking some points on the axis or some other point of the, of the state space and then drawing the velocity there or understanding the direction of the velocity there and then drawing the figure corresponding to those velocities, okay? So this finishes the analysis and the examples of phase plane trajectories for linear systems. In the next lecture, we're going to be using or start using this theory to investigate the phase plane trajectories of nonlinear systems around the equilibrium points. Okay? We are going to see that when we have a nonlinear system with multiple equilibrium points, the trajectories around those equilibrium points would be, would be characterized quite easily with the, with the trajectories of the linearized systems around these equilibrium points. Okay? So we're going to make, make a linearization around this equilibrium point, and if we see that, for example, we have a node type of equilibrium point, then I would have, I would have eigenvalues, eigenvectors like this, and the trajectories might be, might be looking looking node type of node type of trajectories okay i'm going to make a linearization around this equilibrium point and if i see that it's a saddle point type of equilibrium points we are going to have local trajectories around this equilibrium point would look like that saddle point type of equilibrium point for the linear system. And we are going to see that if we have focus type of equilibrium point, we are going to have stable or unstable uh, oscillations around that equilibrium point. We will see that linearization and drawing the trajectories of the linearized system around the equilibrium points will give us some local information about the phase plane trajectories of nonlinear systems around equilibrium points. What does local information mean? It means that these, these trajectories of the linear systems that we can draw around these equilibrium points would only be correct in a small neighborhood around this equilibrium point. Okay? If, if the system, is, system state is far away from the equilibrium points, then those linear, linear uh, system trajectories might not be really useful. So why is that? Because linearized systems would be good approximations only in small neighborhoods around each equilibrium point. So if I find a node type of equilibrium point in the linearized system, 
the trajectories would look like this only in a small neighborhood around that equilibrium point. Because that linearized system is only a valid approximation of the system around, around this equilibrium point in a small neighborhood. Similar for the, for the other cases. So we will see that, for example, when we have this dynamics in a small neighborhood, that 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 figure might be quite different if we get far away from the equilibrium point. In a linear system, it really doesn't matter how far away from the equilibrium point we are. I will have a saddle point type of dynamics or I will have a, I will have, have a fo stable focus type of dynamics. However far away, I go away from the equilibrium point for a linear system. Because the system is linear and its dynamics really do not depend on how far away from the equilibrium point we are. But for a nonlinear system, when we make the linearization, we are assuming that the state of the nonlinear system is close to the equilibrium point. Point, okay? And if we draw the trajectories of the system based on the linearized systems, such trajectories would only be valid in, in that small neighborhood around these equilibrium points. The dynamics of the system or the global phase portraits of the system away from the equilibrium points could be quite different than what we draw around the equilibrium points. Okay. So this was just, just a very brief introduction of what we're going to do in the next lecture, but that is all for this one. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.